Greetings, 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 aliens and friends here on the internet. Welcome to Photos with Stories, the January 31st, 2021 edition. Uh, super excited to be back again. Our last one two weeks ago with Bob Barsodi was super, super fun. Uh, if you missed it, I believe you can go and find it on YouTube. Just look up Photos with Stories. Uh, that show last week with Bob was all about the history of Bill Graham Presents and, and Bill Graham the Man and their connection with all the Grateful Dead stuff they did, amongst other things. So go check that one out. Uh, this week, today, we have a very cool guest. We have a guy named Steve Schneider. And uh, Steve is a Seattle-based photographer. And um, I know Steve because we used uh, his photograph from June of 1978 in a book that I published a couple of years ago called Eyes of the World, Grateful Dead Photography, 1965-1995. Um, but before we get started with Steve, I just want to do my usual thank yous. I want to thank my, my crew who is behind the scenes, Will Schwerd, who's our video director, Harrison Ezradi, and his um, intern, Joe Lentini, who will be fielding questions. If you have any questions for me or Steve, uh, anywhere that you're watching this program where they can accept comments, you can put in your questions. So if you're watching it on Facebook, you can watch it on my Facebook page. You can watch it on fans, uh, the fans Facebook page. I think you can watch it on the Capitol Theater in Port Chester Facebook page. And uh, this week also, you can actually watch it on the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation Facebook page. And uh, that also brings me to um, our charity for the week, which is the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation. Uh, it is not required to watch this show, but if you have the ability and you would like to uh, contribute and donate a small contribution to the Bill Graham Foundation, uh, it is pretty easy to do. And that link is in there. And um, uh, so just go ahead and um, uh, go to the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation. You know, I'm live on the internet. Thank you. <laughs> a visit from my daughter wandering in. Um, anyway, so yeah, so go to the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation on the internet and uh, check them out, or you can donate on the links that they've provided through fans.live, um, right on the homepage of fans.live. Um, thanks to Pete Shapiro, Jonathan Healy, Corinne, uh, Steph May, the marketing people for putting uh, the graphics together for us and really helping out and making this show um, what it is. So we really want to thank all you guys. And um, so uh, Steve Schneider, um, he is, as I mentioned, a Seattle-based photographer. And that's Steve there uh, in Spain running, uh, running, running from the Bulls. What do they call it? Running, running, running with the bulls. bulls. Running with the Bulls in uh, 1973, I believe, holding a big giant two liter uh, glass of beer. Uh, as a young lad. And so Steve is like a, you know, classic late 1960s um, hippie. Uh, he grew up in uh, Southern California, just east of Los Angeles, about 20 miles or so, 20, 30 miles east of LA in Whittier, right around there. And um, graduated high school in 1969, uh, started discovering rock and roll you know, in high school, like many people do, had some friends and whatnot who were who were into the scene. And um, uh, he saw the Grateful Dead in 1971. I think his first concert was in 1967 with the Chicago Transit Authority, CTA, who eventually, of course, became Chicago. Uh, in high school, he did the usual things. He took pictures for the yearbook. He was an editor in the, in, in the paper. Uh, he went to Cal Poly in Pomona, for just a brief period of time before he dropped out because he probably heard Tim Leary say something like tune in, turn on and drop out. And he did all of those things because he was a good hippie. And, um, and uh, uh, beginning in around 1973, 74 is when he started taking photographs for fun. And uh, he has made a living as a photographer for many, many decades. Um, and uh, he's going to tell us about some of that stuff. So, Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you hanging out with us on a Sunday morning in the West Coast and a Sunday afternoon on the East Coast. And uh, tell me a little bit about um, why you picked up a camera, what interest interested you in that, what intrigued you about the camera, and what it did for you, 
you know, psychologically, like, did you, did it turn you on? And uh, obviously you were taking pictures in high school and you, you got the bug and you were developing pictures in a dark room on your own. Talk to me about those early, early days with a camera. Well, my brother who was two years older than I am was also a photographer and I kind of liked that. And I said, Oh, that's worth a try. Let's do it. And my parents were kind of hesitant because they said, you're just doing it because your brother's doing it. I said, yeah. And then so I started taking the photo classes in high school and it just went along from there. Just like, hey, this is good. This is fun. I can do this. And, you know, it's great. it was a great way to meet people because everybody liked their picture taken back then. And they all you know, made crazy shots, good shots, nice portraits. But it was just uh, in high school, you know, it's a way to cope with high school. Right. Um, did it and help? In the 60s with Vietnam on our, on our, uh, background i guess in our background but in the back of our minds that some of some of us would be having to go because 69 it was going crazy did you get a draft card oh yeah i got drafted uh, but I you never my, went i you, failed my physical because of my asthma oh okay good for you All right, yeah. so, you know, asthma got you out of um going over to vietnam to kill women children and babies good for you yeah i, um, I didn't, didn't want to go so Tell me, tell me what you did. Uh, where, where were you in 73, 74 when you first started picking up a camera and trying to shoot some rock and roll? And I believe that some of your first shots here are these photographs of Neil Young, which we'll go through. But lead me up to that. Uh, you got out of high school. You went to college. You dropped out after, I think, two years, you said. You traveled in Europe for six months, hence the photograph of, uh, of you running with the bulls here that I have. Um, bring me up until you actually bring a camera to go photograph Neil Young, which I believe is 1974, 73, 73, 73 at the Anaheim Convention Center. Uh, where were you living? And bring me up to that point from high school uh, 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 or, or from, from going to Europe back to the United States and, and going to Neil Young. Well, when I got back from Europe, uh, I said I couldn't stay and live near uh, – La Mirada, Whittier, where my parents were. So I had a friend who lived at the beach. I said, come on down. And so I moved down to the beach, Huntington Beach, which is just, uh, I guess, north of Newport Beach, just south of Long Beach. It's an oil town, actually. There's a lot of oil derricks all over the town. And I ran into a friend, and uh, we started hanging out, doing stuff that you do when you're seven to 73. And I got a job uh, hauling sailboats across country for about a year and a half. And took my camera with me on those trips and then got back and, hey, Neil Young's coming to town. Let's go. And I got a ticket. And so let's try it. And at that point, you didn't even need a photo pass. You were allowed to just carry your camera into a show and and shoot from your seat or walk up front if it was GA or whatever. Uh, was this show, the Anaheim Convention Center, was this a seated show, do you remember? Or was it a GA yeah, I was show? seated. I had a seats in the back maybe 20 rows back I had a friend who had a seat in the second row front row whatever and uh we exchanged tickets for a couple set songs and right I snapped the shots and i think this was a stray gators tour um, that, yeah because sure he's, he's got in there on the on the pedal steel who, who is that who just i think is it ben keith no it's not, it could be ben keith or it could be nils lofgren i'm not sure because nils played steel for a while oh he did i didn't know that okay yeah but that's probably and, bad. Uh, it doesn't look like yeah, Neil's. Such a simpler time where you could just walk up to the front, switch seats, have a camera, and nobody cared. You know, yeah. it's it's become such a more such a more corporate thing. And I love just some of these shots. So, um, had you been shooting color slides? Like, I mean, you walk into a Neil Young show. There's stage lighting. You've got fast the, the fastest film available at the time. This is not an easy thing to do unless you really knew how to expose film. Um, how did you, how'd you succeed on try number one? Like try with, on air. Right. Uh, I had a 2.8 lens. I knew that from high school, you had to have the fastest lens. It was, I was a Canon F1 user back then. I was probably a 135, 2.8. I couldn't afford it. I don't even know if Canon had a 200 2.8 back then. They might've, but. Right. I had that one in my usual. So you, know, you were so you were aware of the combination of shutter speed, f-stop, 
um, uh, and, and film speed, you know, the trifecta to actually be able to expose film in, in, in low lighting, essentially. You were aware good, of, uh, of those things at that point. Yeah, my uh, high school photography teacher was a really good teacher. We learned a lot. He was pretty, you know, strict with our, our mess ups. But he says, hey, you don't learn, you know, you got to learn from your mistakes. And, and, and uh, so you took these classes in high school and, and Pomona and college. Did you do any photography classes? No, I just uh, tried to uh, get my general uh, education out of the way at college. Right. Yeah, and so, first two years. So essentially you are self-taught as a photographer. For the rock and roll. Yeah. Right. All right. And then, uh, and then in 74, uh, you were, you were in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, you went and saw the Crosby Stills National Young Tour. How'd you end up in Tempe? That was part of the years when I was driving truck across country. I had a delivery, I guess it was in Dallas or somewhere in Texas. And I knew I was going to the show because I have a good buddy of mine who I've known since uh, second grade. He lived in Phoenix at that time. So I knew I was going to the show and I said, let's go. We got tickets and I took off on my job and dropped the boats off. And on the way back home to uh, LA, you stop at Phoenix and we went to the show and it was a, Hot day in July, as you can see the pictures of Graham Nash without a shirt on. Yeah, I know, which, which is just so classic, you know, how how non-glitzy it all was in the 70s, you know. Um, just, you know, this skinny hippie from Manchester, England, takes his shirt off and, and uh, um, is performing, you know, live. And then, so you were a big Neil Young fan because it seems like you shot Neil several times. Uh, then in 77, you're in Santa Cruz. Uh, and these, this shot here is from Santa Cruz, uh, a couple of them. And then we get to Neil Young and Crazy Horse in, in 96. Uh, at this point, you're, you've left Southern California and you're living in Seattle. And so I believe that this show is at the Gorge. And were you a regular concert goer at the Gorge? Oh, yeah. We had for, I think, since 99 or 98, three of us uh, had season a seat license they called it for uh, the same three seats 20th row dead center at the gorge and all we had to do is uh they said do you want to go we said yeah we'll go to this show and we went and we didn't want to go to that show they released the tickets got and it so and it was easy to go to the shows and at times you smuggle your gear in there too so this was a photo so, pass. I had I had access from Neil on this one. And, and so uh, so in '96 at this Crazy Horse show, how were you getting access to come shoot to go and shoot him? I think that was uh, probably UPI. So what what did UPI stand for? United Press International. United Press International. They were the premier wire service back then. Them and and AP Associated Press. Right, and UPI doesn't exist anymore. And UPI was a conglomerate of freelance photographers around the country, around the world, I guess. And uh, they would submit photos to the different bureaus and they would put them out on the wire for either news stories and UPI would make their money by licensing these to the different newspapers and magazines that they work with. So you also so had staffers. Oh, they had staff, but you were never a staff photographer. No, correct? I was just a uh, freelance. And so uh, this particular show at the Gorge, uh, weren't they filming a, a, a the Year of the Horse or something at this the show? The Year of the Horse was filmed part of uh, At the Gorge. And the best thing about that whole show is it rained like cats and dogs. You know how it can rain up here in Seattle. And Neil and uh, boys decided to play. And they just, you would think they would just kind of go through the motions to play. They stepped up and kicked ass. And it was just, uh, it was incredible. And we were just soaked. So much so that we didn't camp. We were going to camp and spend the night there. But we were wet. So we just right. packed up and drove home and we dried out. When we got home. Right. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the photo that I have up here right now is the black and white one. And you can see Neil is drenched. Billy Talbot to his right. The bass player, his hair is drenched. You can just see that. Uh, but that's just such a typical thing. And I don't know if it's the same show or the same film, Year of the Horse, but they also did a live at Red Rocks live release that I think was also a DVD and a CD, but maybe just a CD. And that also was pouring rain at Red Rocks. Yeah. I remember seeing that and, and the, the cover of the record, as you can see the rain coming down. And uh, um, how did you discover Neil Young and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young just as a teenager on the radio from friends, brother. Oh yeah. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young or Crosby, Stills and Nash. 
67, 68 when they first came out. Right. New Neil Young from uh, everything. Everybody knows this Nowhere album. Right. The Loner album. And just always been a Neil fan. I just loved his music and loved his words. One of your loved faves. Words kind of fit us, you know, when we were growing up. Yeah. One of your faves next to the Grateful Dead, would you yeah. say? Yeah. I mean, me too. It's interesting for me out of all the, uh, out of all the bands I photographed, I think I photographed the Grateful Dead and Neil Young the most. Uh, I, and uh, one of these days I will do a Neil Young book, you know, just not ready for it to happen yet, but someday. Uh, You've got some great uh, stuff for Neil. You've been with them a long time. So. Yeah. I, well, I first shot him when I was in high school in 78 or nine. I can't remember. I think it was 78, September 78, uh, be, uh, beginning of my senior year at Madison Square Garden, got a couple of okay shots. Uh, and then in 80, late eighties, when I moved to the, when I was in the Bay area, I started shooting him pretty much regularly every year since then. Uh, and then these shots are, uh, more recent, uh, promise of the real, uh, which is his latest band flip flopping with, with crazy horse a little bit with, uh, Lucas and Mike and Nelson. This shot right here is with Neil and Mike and Nelson. These are Willie Nelson's kids. And if you haven't seen this incarnation of Neil Young with promise of the real, it is, it is a truly a phenomenal uh, high energy experience with Neil bringing in kind of these young bucks and really just taking off. Uh, the first time I watched Lucas jam with Neil was at a bridge school benefit and uh, they were up on stage. I think they were doing rock in the free world and Lucas didn't have a guitar and uh, Poncho uh, you know, the guitar player in Crazy Horse handed Lucas his acoustic guitar and him and Neil just like back to back and just rocking out at the end of it. And Lucas jumped in the air and did his split like he always does. And Neil's looking at him and laughing and he rolls down and falls over and almost knocks over some amps. And it was just like one of those epic, epic rock and roll moments. Uh, yeah, it was a fun show. And where was this one right here? Where was this? Uh, it's called the Wamu Theater. It's a, uh... A crazy, terrible place. It's an exhibit hall that sits underneath the uh, football stadium. That they actually had to put thick carpet, uh, thick curtains all around it, and then the and up in the ceiling and everywhere just to keep it from echoing so much. Oh, interesting. Okay, was, I, I would have uh, thought the I would have thought the Wamu Theater would be a nice amphitheater, but apparently, uh, apparently no, it's not. not a good theater, and I don't even know what they call it now because Wamu is dead. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, it probably killed Washington Mutual, and they had a, you know, that that the venue, you know, them sponsoring uh, them with the banking crisis, you know, killed killed the brand. Um, but it was that was fun, you know. It's at uh, the last minute, I got my photo pass. Uh, one of Neil's, uh, I think it was, oh Mary or Marty Janisi, I can't remember his name now, called me up just like ten minutes after my friends called me up, so they got an extra ticket for me, and they said, oh. You want to go shoot the show tonight? Sure. So I took off. And the crazy thing about it, I grabbed both my cameras, a short lens and long lens, and one of my cameras didn't have a battery in it. Ah. They both had they both had cards. So since you, it was easy to do because you can't shoot two cameras at once. Right. But I was so always were, changing batteries. I was gonna say you're either switching batteries or switching lenses. Yeah, you know, back in the film days, I was a multi-camera guy, always carried a minimum of two cameras with me. Uh, but since I started shooting digital, I just, you know, and as I get older, my back, you know, I just, I'm, I'm a one camera guy and have all my lenses in pouches around me and just some always switching lenses, which is not the most efficient thing to do. But, uh, um, I also like having the variety of shooting with prime lenses as well as zoom lenses. Um, but, uh, all right. So let's move on to Emmy Lou Harris, which is from 2015. And, uh, this show here is. Up in Seattle, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, uh, it's at the Woodland Park Zoo. Woodland Park Zoo. It's uh, they have a nice little area, open area that they've been hosting uh, shows there for many years. And uh, Emmy Lou and Rodney have come up here three or four times, and and so they. It's just a nice little venue, and then I got my access to Rodney. So I got to know him or his manager many years ago, and they sort of know me, I guess, in the picture of him pointing at me. I just missed it by a hair. He was pointing at me and smiling and I got, oops, missed it by a fraction of a second. Right. So I was looking yeah. at Emmy, making sure I was focused and you know how it is when you're, Oh yeah. You got three songs. We've all missed that shot by a split second. Many, many times. It's uh, as we say, you know, we're just trying to catch lightning in a bottle and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, no, but they're, they're a good, uh, Rodney and his 
manager, really good people. I have had plenty of access with them and I sent them all the images I have. So if they ever want to use them, you know, they can use them. Right on. And uh, I want to remind everybody that if you have any questions at the end of the program, uh, you can uh, at any time just put them in any of the comments on any of the places that you're watching that accepts comments and we'll get to them at the end of the show. Um, we've got uh, we've got our pal Harrison and Joe Lentini um, fielding those questions. So please send them in. Um, the Grateful Dead calendar, 1982. I've got mine right here. Um, and you can see Steve has his right behind him on the wall. And Steve just sent me this a few weeks ago. Very nice gift. Thank you so much. And the thing that's so cool about the 1982 calendar is that in 2021, all the days line up again. So it's a, actually a, acts as a 2021 calendar. So I'm guessing, what is it, every seven years maybe they line up again. So this is the third or so, third or fourth time. Uh, well, no, I guess it's more like 40 years. So maybe this is the fourth or fifth time since it's uh, lined up over the years. Uh, but very cool calendar. And when I was looking at it, you know, it was amazing because there was all this great stuff from 1980 in here, which looks like either uh, like the New Year shows where they did an acoustic set after they had, they had done the electric stuff. But uh, uh, thanks for the great calendar. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to, to, to hang on to that. Um, you had a long relationship photographing the Grateful Dead. I love this wall of sound shot. And I don't think that you had the scan when we were doing the Grateful Dead Eyes of the World book. And by the way, that Eyes of the World book is essentially sold out. Um, uh, there is maybe uh, 20 or so copies that you can find on my website, and they're all slightly damaged. They all have like little dings in the corner because the book is sold out. So we've got like, there was 20 of these and so people were asking me if I had any. And so we lowered the price. And so if you're interested, go to rockoutbooks.com and you can check it out. There's a few left, not a lot. Uh, I but got Steve about five a or six and gave them to my friends. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, so you, Steve was a contributor to that book, but I love this photograph of, of the wall of sound here. I just love this angle. I love that it's in color. Um, just the beauty and the simplicity of it all. Um, when you got to the show and you saw the speakers, were you just like, holy fuck, what is this? Or yeah, did we you? Knew, we, knew, we knew about it, but it, you got to see it live to really appreciate and how it sounded and how those guys are probably get, are deaf afterwards. Right. And this is at UC Santa Barbara in 74. And is this the only show that you shot, shot or saw with Wall of Sound? Yes. Right. And uh, and at this point, have you started, quote unquote, following the Grateful Dead, driving longer distances to see shows? Or is this sort of the beginning for you in about 74? Oh, we started seeing shows. Me and right. a friend of mine, his name was Gerald. It's all, we'll leave the last name unknown. Uh, he was a, he was the taper and I was the photographer. We, we called ourselves eyes and ears. Nice. We would get the shows early enough to tape. Of course, the dad let you tape. And I had to get, we had to get early enough to get in line to get pictures. And, but I didn't meet Gerald till, uh, oh, probably late seven, mid seventies, mm -hmm. probably a couple of years after the wall of sound. Right. We didn't go to the day of the green together. You didn't, right. And that's what I'm showing here now. So Day on the Green, of course, was a big concert series that Bill Graham did every summer at the stadium in Oakland. And this is a really unique one because this was the Grateful Dead and the Who. And uh, we have the Who photos a little bit later. But uh, were you, uh, did you have a photo pass for this or did you just shoot from the audience as a fan? That was and, the audience um, shot. You know how it is. You get there early, you work your way up front. We found a good spot and hung out just such a classic time with weir with that ibanez and 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 the bobby beard i'm looking at the shot where he's laughing and mickey's laughing and jerry's laughing you know it's just so fun to look at these photos where jerry is young and thin and 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 fit and uh i mean even the microphones between bob and jerry they're just like you know five six seven feet apart um and then they're playing in a stadium and they're still sort of scrunched together um, you know, that, that kind of thing just doesn't happen anymore in rock and roll. Everybody, everything is so spread out. And, and, uh, to me, you know, a great shot is always like, you know, how many band members can you get in a shot? Not just like, here's a solo shot. Here's a solo shot. Here's a two shot. It's like, how do you get these guys to move to the, to the center of the stage? Uh, and then we, we move on and, and we've got the cow palace, new year's Eve, 76. 
So, and you're living in, in, in Southern California still. So you're driving back and forth. And uh, at this point, had you met anybody in the Grateful Dead camp that was giving you, that was maybe you were becoming friends with or was going to maybe give you a photo pass? Had you met any their publicist or, or anybody in the management office or anything like that? Well, I think it was, uh, yeah, there it is. 77, uh, February 27th of 77. It was the Robinson Jim right after the Swing Auditorium show. Uh, I was selling my, you know, eight by 10 pictures. You know how it is. Veggie yeah. burritos and, and Grateful Dead photos. Yeah. And I, it was so easy. I kind of walked backstage and, or whatever they were and ran into uh, Mickey and Phil and started talking. And later on, you'll see the one picture I gave of in the, in that uh, New Year's show I gave to Phil because he liked it. It was him and Donna. And then Mickey complained that I don't from have any the, pictures. Uh, from, the, from the Cow Palace or a different from one? The Cow Palace, yeah. So uh, I think it's the last it. shot on here. That one there. Oh, yeah. Here we go. I'm on it right now. Got it. Yeah, Phil no, loved that shot. And so I uh -huh. gave it to him. Nice. And then uh, I started sending pictures to the dead. And I kept sending large photos, 16 by 20s, 20 by 30s. Uh -huh. Everybody sends eight by tens. Right. I was working and in a photo lab. Got yeah. it. So you could, so you can make them easy on your, and your off hours or whatever. Nobody cared. Employee discount. Right. Awesome. And, and uh, then uh, I started sending this up. Then Gerald got a hold of me and, and it wasn't until I guess really uh, 1980 Alaska show where I met uh, Gerald and uh, Eileen law. Got it. And of course, From that point on access. Right. And of course, Gerilyn being Gerilyn Brandelius, who was partners with Mickey Hart at the time and, and uh, who we recently lost uh, uh, to, to heart failure not too long ago. Uh, all right. So these are and these these Cal Palace New Year shows, uh, uh, the Cal Palace New Year's 76. This was your first Grateful Dead New Year's Eve, correct? Yes. And then we go to the we go back to Southern California to the Swing Auditorium, which was at Pal, uh, which is in Riverside. You see. Riverside, yeah. You see, you see, you see, University of California Riverside. Is that what that no, is? No, it was just a, an auditorium in Riverside. It was a sweaty little, dark, dank, hot son of a bitch place to go to a concert. And this what, uh, was it. Show a, was, it was it was it a sit down theater or was it an arena? Oh, it was, uh, it was uh, GA. Got just it. On okay. The floor. It was, I can't. There could have been seats in the back, but we never did seats. Right. But uh, this show here is obviously the first Terrapin Station, the first. Estimated profit played live. Nice. And this is uh, the swing in 77, Feb 26, I think it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, just love the, you know, love, love the, love that 77 look and the Travis Bean guitar and Bobby still's got the beard. And then the sticker uh, on Jerry's guitar. Yeah. The sticker the enemy was, is listening. The enemy is listening. Absolutely. Yep. And, uh, and then we get over to, and at this point, are you shooting slide film or negative film? At the time, it was, uh, seemed like it was more negative than anything, but I shot both, whatever. I, the old days with the film, it was, you, sp you spun your own. Right. It, you, know, you buy your 100 foot and make your own rolls. It was cheaper that way. Oh, yeah, I did it too. But you also have problems of the tape falling off at the end. Yeah. Or, or getting scratched or, you know, all sorts of weird things. All right. So this brings us to New Year's Eve at Winterland in 77, 78. We got the shot of them from behind with the drummers. So this is, this is Winterland. So you're up in the balcony behind them. It's a, you know, classic shot. Um, uh, Ed Perlstein's got some great stuff from up there at the closing of Winterland. Uh, love this shot here of Phil and, and Jerry looking at each other. Phil's got the towel around his neck. And also the thing that I love about this shot is look at those people with their arms on the stage, no photo pit, no barricade. Yeah. It's like, you know, these people are just leaning on that stage. It's just such, such the, created such a different vibe, you know, like that scene in the Grateful Dead movie at Winterland in 77, where, you know, the guys leaning on the stage singing U S blues, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, just su such classic, time period and of course uh, this is such a weird thing where the balloons are falling down and they didn't come out of the bag and they landed on top of phil which i thought was just classic um and then i love love this shot here uh with the balloons coming down phil with that red hat on and you could see everybody in the band even though it's from behind but phil's what was that experience like for you 
as a photographer and a dead fan? Like, did you feel like you were capturing this important moment at the time or you were just at this point where you're just like, this is really fun and I'm just happy to get some photos to hang on my wall. That's it right there. It was fun. Cause you knew, you knew it was, uh, they were, they played well then that Winterland is really a great place to see. Cause you can walk all the way around there were two beer bars and then the beer bar upstairs, you know, had the music and the video going. So you didn't miss anything. And the fact that their speakers weren't very high, so you can sit right behind the stage. Right. And they had speakers facing us so you can hear the sound. And this picture here of the band, the one similar to that, uh, Bill Walton has. I, uh -huh. sent it to, I sent it to Mickey, and the band signed it and gave it to Bill back in the days when he was having his foot problem. And actually, it is in his house in one of his rooms because I saw an article about Bill Walton in San Diego and it was showing his house, and there was the picture. Bill's got a lot of great memorabilia hanging in his house, that's for yeah. sure. There's a great little documentary that just came out on Bill on uh, 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 as part of the Fire on the Mountain thing that they did. Uh, they did sort of little interstitial stuff with Bill at his house, and they show some of his memorabilia. But I believe that ESPN is actually maybe even working on a longer documentary about Bill. Um, I hope so. Well, I, have a, I have an um, interesting story about Bill. We, he, when he was playing with the Celtics, the year he was, I think it was 86, the year he was the uh, official six man on b basketball, he came to town and I was shooting for uh, UPI and had a photo pass. And afterwards I said, hey, can you go out tonight? He says, yeah, I can't because we're not playing tomorrow. So we'll go back to his hotel room. And all of a sudden he gets a call from Larry Bird. And he's at a, a restaurant saying, we don't like the food here. So, so, well, I know a place. You guys like Italian. Yeah. So me and my blue van drove down to pick up Larry Bird, Danny Ainge, and they all jumped in my van. And of course, I still had my snow tires in the van. <laughs> and they were, you know, these long legged guys couldn't just stretch out. And we drove down to a little restaurant in uh, uh, Pioneer Square, you know where that area is, down by sure. the stadiums. Uh -huh. And we just sat there and uh, bullshit and ate and talked and everybody paid their own way and and people kind of came by and said hi, but didn't bother us. And then I drove them back to the hotel and said thanks. It was very cool. <laughs> Classic moment. Uh, moving on, Bakersfield in 78. Garcia's moved on to the Wolf guitar. I really love this shot here because, again, you know, it's, it's so many people in the shot. There's five people. We got Jerry, Bob, Phil, Donna, and Mickey's head in the background there. You know, just, again, that con con compression of the stage. I mean, the microphone, Donna's microphone is like three feet away from Bobby's. I just love, you know, the, I love what's going on in this photo, even with the microphone blocking Bobby's face like that, which sometimes if it was just a shot of Bobby, it would probably really bother me oh, yeah. you know, if I took it. But because of all the stuff that's going on in this photo, it's just really just tells a story. Donna's wailing, Bobby's wailing, Jerry's looking back over, you know, he's over by Phil because they're like really in that moment. Um, you know, is this a, is this a kind of shot that you were always also looking for? Cause I know for me as a photographer, I'm always looking for a shot like that. Well, I always want to get the drummers in there and, you know, to get the drummers in, you know, you got, you got to get the guys in front. Right. It was just back in those days, I was just shooting, you know, shooting goes fun. We were, up real close. We, uh, we spent the night in line for the first time. We were actually first in line for the Bakersfield show. We got there at night. Nice. And we were, we were sleeping on the couch or the, not the couch, but the concrete. And the cops came by and said, what are you guys here? What are you doing here? We said, we're, we're in line for the show. When? Tomorrow. And they looked at us and go, okay, you guys are crazy. And they never <laughs> came back. <laughs> Uh, like they didn't uh, understand the dead. <laughs> yeah. Love the shot of Garcia also with, you know, with the glasses down, just sort of in that moment and uh, 78. So you're still just a fan in the audience, just getting up close, getting that shot. Um, the Bakersfield show where this is from, this is a GA show also, correct? Yes. Right. Uh, UC Santa Barbara. Here you are over on the side of the stage. Nice big wide shot. Uh, really shows the 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 what's going on. I, I it's you know I love this shot because you can see the gear, you can see the monitors that are on stage. You know this is sort of pre Meyer sound and and uh, that that one monitor over behind Keith with all the little tweeters uh, um, as well as the big you know the bigger speakers um, and then uh, and then of course the next shot is uh, 
Garcia looking over behind Weir, almost essentially looking right at you. And this is the photograph that we use in the Eyes of the World book that I was talking about earlier. Uh, how'd you get on stage? That was, a, uh, I think it might have been my first photo pass from Gerilyn. And I asked Gerilyn, hey, can I get on stage? And she was pretty tight with everybody back then and walked me up on the stage. And I started um, moving further out, further out, because you couldn't, I don't want to shoot for their backs. And I got right there, shot a bunch of frames. And next thing you know, big hand was on my shoulder. And Steve Perry said, you're gone. You went too far. But I got the picture. Did he rip your photo pass off you? Oh, yeah. Ripped it, ripped it right off me. Ripped it in half and said, out. Uh -huh, okay. Classic. Thank you. I got the picture. He didn't right. take my film. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I had Steve Parrish escort me out of a backstage once in 1980. Um I was a little high on acid. So, you know, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I had no business being in the dressing room anyway, but uh, uh, there I was. <laughs> he yeah, picked, me up on, picked me up on my shirt collar. And he's like, young man, you are and just escort. It was after the show. So escorted me right out the side door out onto the sidewalk. I'm like, okay, here I go. Uh, all right. Moving on. Why does Bobby not have a guitar and is singing a cappella or karaoke? I don't around know and around. Doing. What's that song was around and around. Okay. And it was, uh, 1978 October. What I got it right down here. October, October the, five, the, the five night run, five, five night, night run. run. Uh-huh. Evidently his strap broke and it had, I think it might've been the strap where it hooks onto the guitar because they couldn't fix it. They tried to fix it. And then he just gave up and, you know, how the dead, okay, let's keep going. And then he finished the song. And I guess a friend of mine told me this was about midnight when it happened. And they just finished the song. And of course, I loved the part where they were looking at each other and facing the crowd. And again, I was there at Winter Land, the back, right behind the stage where they let you sit. Right. Donna's just, Donna's just cracking up here. So this is yeah. Winter Land. So you're just up in the balcony. Yeah, right there at the very first row. Right. Which is really interesting because the angle is not that high. Right, because the stage is up high enough and the balcony is low enough. I mean, it's the ice skating rink. And I mean, it almost looks like you're just standing on stage and you're up on like an equipment case, you know, that you're not even that far back. Just which, about. You know, which I, 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 I wish I had that opportunity to shoot like that at Winterland at, at one point, but I guess I never did. So, and I love these last two shots of Bob and Donna where they're just, uh, you know, kind of cracking up and their arms around each other. And then we get to the closing of Winterland. Um, uh, 1970, 1978, going into 1979, Donna in the gown. I love this photograph also. Another photo that I wish I could have put in that book, but I don't think you had it scanned at the time to share with me. I never had seen it before. And again, the reason why I love this photograph is that you can see every single band member. Um, you know, you got, it's just, it's just one of those perfectly composed photos um, from Mickey on the right, all the way over to Bobby on the left uh, Keith with just the little small electric piano, just one of those classic, classic um, uh, photos. Uh, were you hooked on New Year's at this point? Like you were like, couldn't felt like you couldn't miss a New Year's after doing 76, 77, and now you're at 78 or were you, and did you also want to go to the show because you knew it was the end of Winterland, the end of an era? Oh, that was definitely it. We, did, we saw him in California, I think at uh, a couple nights earlier where they played the UCLA. And then this is another one that with German, Got me with one photo pass and I got to buy three tickets. So I bought three tickets for my friends, my sister, my friend Gerald, and another guy named Gary. And I got in real early, which is weird, and got up and set up in the balcony where this we want to sit for the all night. Because, you know, it was the three sets. Right. There was, the breakfast was served in the morning. And we right. wanted to sit because I wasn't going to be standing all night. And this was being broadcast live on KQED television. And at the end of the show, they did "We Bid You Good Night," and you went to the balcony, of the balcony, and that's what this photograph here is, correct? Yeah, we were walking on our way around to go downstairs to eat, and I still had three or four frames left of my camera, and they came back out and we were doing "We Bid You Good Night," and it was not broadcast. They had turned off the TV or off the uh, cameras. So if I you love see all the DVD. The it's just a black and white. Uh, photos from other photographers 
with the song and then my picture ends the old dvd right because they have the audio but they had no video i love yeah. all the i love all the looks on everybody's faces i mean there's got to be what three in the morning or something like that i think um, it's closer to six or seven because we breakfast was served at dawn wow we actually had breakfast all right amazing how bill graham um, did it i don't remember but he did it right this is one of the later day photos of garcia um uh this is from may of 95 so this is really this is getting close to the end of uh, of garcia here playing the lightning bolt guitar um and this first shot here which one of these was in time magazine which one was it? the one where he's singing into the microphone yeah the second one right this one's from time magazine full page and, and this was in one of, in, in one of the tribute issues the very uh, i think it was august 21st the very first issue after his death it was probably about two three pages of stories right but my picture uh was right next to the story how did how did time magazine find this photo and find you i had an agency back in uh, dc sepa press sure i was selling them a lot of my political stuff all the other stuff that was happening in seattle i'd send them to them and you know their kurt cobain stuff my rock and roll they sold it editorially right uh, and then, uh they said when I heard uh, Garcia died, I immediately got my stuff together and it was out that next, that same day to uh, New York. Cause back then you had to fed extra your, your slides and negatives to them. Sure. But you got them back. Got them back. And uh, they said, uh, yeah, we, uh, time magazine bought a picture. Okay. Thanks. And I took off for the weekend to Montana to visit a friend. Right. And coming back in, uh, at SeaTac airport, it was the Time Magazine on the rack. I grabbed it, looked at it, and just, you know, big smile and said, I left the, I left the magazine. I didn't buy it then. I went and bought it later, but not then. Right. It was, a, it was a sad day, but I'm glad it was my photo. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly had a lot of photos in magazines during that period as well. A lot of tributes were out there. Um, when I first saw this photo, it freaked me out a little bit because I knew that Zappa did not like The Grateful Dead. But I thought, wow, cool. He jammed with the Grateful Dead. But then I found out that he didn't jam with the Grateful Dead. And this photograph is this bizarre, weird, happy accident, I guess we'll call it. Uh, what is the story behind Frank Zappa and Jerry Garcia being in the same photo? And, that, and I do want to point out that this is not Photoshop trickery. These two people are on the same piece of film, Correct. Yes, and the film is just a little longer than a 35 millimeter. Back in the days when you couldn't afford all this film, you would spool a roll in, shoot 10, 15 shots, take it out, write on the leader how many frames you are, and then make sure you look the next time you pull the frame, the film out. Well, I didn't. I think it was 81 when Zappa was here in town. So that's got to be 81 Jerry somewhere. And you just shoot, shoot, shoot. And next thing you know, when I processed it, I go, uh-oh, and 10 or 15 frames didn't work very well, but one did. And you can so see basically, the edge of his guitar is like uh, Halo or missing part of the guitar. Right, but you can't really tell because of the black shirt. So basically you shot 10 or 15 pictures of Jerry Garcia, took the roll of film out, you leave the leader out, and then, and I've done this too. I know exactly what you're talking about. Normally you would, you would take your camera, you put it against your chest or put a lens cap on it. I would put it against my chest and I would blow off 15 shots or 17 shots to go past where you in theory were. And then you'd be starting with the second half of the roll of film sort of fresh, but you didn't realize it. So you were essentially just making double exposures by accident. And you ended up with a picture of Zappa and Garcia on the, on the same frame, which yeah, is just, it was, it was you like, know. you know, Oh, this is cool. So we call it a kindred spirits. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. Moving on from the Grateful Dead, Merle Haggard in this uh, classic uh, sweatsuit jacket deal thing that he's got going on, racing jacket. I don't really know what's what's going on. Uh, so this is Merle in the in the late 1980s. Uh, did you dig the sort of Bakersfield country sound, for lack of a better? term for it i don't know is merle considered bakersfield sound yeah he's uh, from bakersfield yeah uh um, well I, like i said i grew up with uh country music frank sinatra big band and rock and roll 
my dad had a nice big nice stereo with huge speakers that he built and when they took off for the weekend we hung around we came over and partied and we couldn't blow the speakers because he was he built them well we played them up to 11. nice and uh here's a great shot of chris christopherson and merle haggard uh in 2009 i believe um yeah. At this point, did you have a relationship with one of these artists that they were giving you access or were you just on assignment? Well, I just applied for PhotoPass and then uh, Merle's uh, people got a hold of me and said, yeah, we want you to come and uh, shoot the show. And they were, what they, This is the first time those two have ever played together. I mean, I'm sorry, not played, toured together. It was a short West Coast tour. Obviously, they played together, but they wanted me to cover the, uh, the tour and I got to shoot the whole show and tried to get a picture of them together afterwards. It couldn't. So this was close enough. They're both almost in focus. Right. Which is hard to do because those guys were 15 feet apart. Yeah. Right. Like I'm saying, nowadays everybody's so, so spread out. Everybody, you know, I, and I guess when we get back to live rock and roll, there'll be real social distancing. Uh, they'll put people like, you know, 30 feet apart. Um, these guys, all these photos of Merlin are uh, his, hopefully some will be used in a book about him. It's being done right now. Nice. So Burl's uh, manager has them also. Yeah. One of the things I'm sad about that I never, never got to photograph Merle. Uh, and then we're back to Emmy Lou and Rodney Crowell again in 2014. Um, where were these photographed? Uh, St. Michelle winery. They have a outdoor uh, event. It's, it uh, was reserve seats and GA. And at this show, I had another, I got a hold of Merle's uh, manager and said, hey, can I shoot the show? And he says, yeah. So when I got there, since we had the GA part, we got there early and we're sitting out in the hot sun, took off my shoes and waited, got a hold of Merle's guy, uh, manager. And he said, come on backstage, get your, your pass. So I walked up there, got on the stage while they're doing the sound checks and stood there off the side waiting. And Rodney Crowell comes over and goes, where are your shoes? So stand here barefoot and said, Hey, they're out there in the in line and started laughing. We started talking a few things and he signed a few of my photos when he's he been in town before. And, and it was kind of fun just chatting with him about music and listen to Emmylou Harris in the background warming up. Yeah. Fun. And I got off the stage and got my three songs and got your shoes back too. I, I yep. I guess your shoes were you, it were just keeping your place in line. Too bad you couldn't do that in the old days with the Grateful Dead. Just leave your shoes there and 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 go back to the hotel and then come back and say, "No, these are my shoes. They were keeping my my spot in line." People would have a meltdown. Um, but it was it was a good show. You know, it was Merle was Merle and Emmy Lou and Rodney were great together. Back, they kind of brought back the days of the Hot Band in the late seventies. Right. Yeah, I've had the. Uh, opportunity to photograph them on stage several times and i and i shot emmy lou and rodney together in a photo studio in austin texas during south by southwest i don't know six seven eight years ago uh for a cover of acoustic guitar magazine so i've, I've also gotten to spend a little bit of time with these guys and i love really them down to earth have you ever come out have you ever come down to the bay area for hardly strictly bluegrass no i wish i had my sister and her husband and a bunch of friends do and i just it might've been, uh, I had a job, you know, I convention summer up here is convention city. Right. And that was my main, that was my bread and butter conventions. Right. Yeah. Uh, Emmy Lou has, has closed out the main stage at hardly strictly bluegrass every year for 20 years. And I think I've photographed, I think 19 of those years. So I've shot her every year on the last Sunday of hardly strictly bluegrass every year. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, the legendary Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, December of 1989. Um, I think he's wearing the same thing in this shot as he's a couple days later when I photographed him. Um, this was in one of the arenas? The Paramount Theater, uh, oh, the nice Paramount. theater. Oh, really? Because here they played in arena. And was this, uh, and did Jeff Beck, was he on this tour? with? I think this Jeff Beck opened, yeah. Or he opened yeah. for Jeff Beck or one of the two. Yeah. Uh, the Bay Area show they did here uh, was Jeff Beck, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and then Santana came out and jammed with Stevie Ray. And at the end of the show, actually, it was, I think, before the show started. I'm sorry. Before the show started, they had hired me to do a big group portrait 
of Stevie Ray and his band, Jeff Beck and his band and all of their crew because it was the last show of the tour. And then Bill Graham also came in and got in on that photograph. And so I have this photograph of Bill and all those other people that I mentioned. And of course, you know, we lost both Bill and Stevie Ray Vaughan to helicopter accidents, you know, within what? A six, year, about six months after this show. Uh, this show right, with, with Stevie Ray Vaughan and Bill Graham was a year after that. Yeah. Um, the, I only got to shoot Stevie Ray Vaughan once. Is this the only time you got to shoot him? Yeah. Yeah, same thing. I mean, we literally shot these within days of each other. And I was the only photographer there too. It's like, why no, why? The local newspaper hardly ever shot rock and roll unless it was the Stones. Right. Really? Yeah, they never. Nobody. Yeah. This, I was, mean, all UPI, you know, this was all UPI access at that time. He, he, here in the Bay Area nowadays, any concert you go to, there could be 5, 10, 15, 20 photographers. Back in the film days, there'd be usually like anywhere from three to five photographers at a show. Yeah, it was great back then. You know, me, Clayton Call, Steve Jennings, maybe, uh, Ken Friedman, who was the Bill Graham photographer, you know, that might be about it. You know, there, you know, maybe a newspaper photographer of the Chronicle or the Oakland paper was, you know, covering it. But, uh, you know, that was it. There just, you know, there were not a lot of people. Uh, Here we have a backstage portrait of the Bangles. Uh, This picture freaks me out a little bit because Susanna Hoffs is like a little, like, pixie girl compared to these other women i i don't understand how she could be so small next to them um, but tall, she is. especially this drummer what's her name yeah and uh uh where's this show this bangle show the paramount theater again and what were you doing backstage getting snapshots of them they say follow me <laughs> and you go and was this a upi assignment a upi assignment full access they got to shoot the whole show upstairs downstairs what year are we talking here? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, it was uh, April 89. Okay, so fairly early. I get, weren't the Bengals even closer to more like 84, 85? So interesting that they were still really, uh, you know, accessible and, and open to, uh, you know, press photographers and not so controlling, you know, even, even four or five years into their career. I don't exactly remember when the Bengals really started, but I want to say it was earlier 80s. Yeah, they and they were, uh, I was, there was only two of us. Right. Always love a good balcony shot, rocking out, fun. I don't know if I ever photographed the bangles. I don't know if I, I don't think I ever did. Um, just great stuff. Uh, Dave Alvin, this is part of a series of photographs that you did with, uh, was this the triple bill? Was it Dave Alvin, Patty Smith, and Junior Brown? Is that all the same show? Say, uh, well, I'm not, not sure it was the same show. It was the same weekend. Uh, okay. The opening of uh, EMP, uh, Paul Allen's music experience uh, museum that uh, now so is called e- Bullpop. Right. So it was the Experience Music Project. There you and, go, yeah. uh, uh, and is the, is it still a very heavily uh, music-based museum or is it a lot of other stuff as well? Now well that it's- that's why it's called Mopop. So that popular... Uh, I don't know, pop, popular pop culture. Or whatever. Pop, pop culture. Art. Got it. Yeah, but it was a it was a three day concert. There was con- a, I think it may have been just a three day event, one or two day shows, but there was like three different uh, stages. So you can go to whatever stage you wanted, show your pass. They let you up front in the pit, whatever. It could have been the fifth song, right? And some of these, uh, these uh, Dave Allen looks like they were shot from the audience. Uh huh. Dave is super fun to shoot, and as is oh, yeah. Junior, as is Junior Brown. Uh, Nirvana. Yeah, <laughs> this is ninety three. Yeah, December so, ninety three. How did you tap? So, had you done any shooting at all of the Seattle scene before it got big? Soundgarden, Pearl Jam. Nirvana, Allison Chains, uh, Mother Love Bone, any of those bands? Did you shoot any of them in small clubs? Or were Not these at that more- time, I just didn't have, uh, I don't know, the access or maybe I was working. Who knows? It was just early in my career I was, and you are got to make money. Right. And so uh, what's the story here with this um, Nirvana shoot that you did? Um, who were you shooting that for? And, it, and did you have to shoot the whole thing from further back or did you shoot this in, intentionally so you can get the 
the mannequin with the the wings from the, the well the at the last the minute uh the reporter from upi called said hey uh mtv called said do you guys want a photo pass and a ticket for your reporter he says sure so he, he called me up and i said oh okay i'll go and what it was is uh the tip the taping of the new year's eve show for mtv pearl jam was supposed to play also but uh, i think it was eddie vetter got sick and they canceled but this was there was a, a riser in the back of the st- uh, hall, kind of like where the soundboard was, and that's where the first shot is. And then they they walked about three or four of us up at a time to the side to shoot to get close, because there must have been twenty photographers at that one. And it was just uh, and was we it, the whole show. Was the taping actually on New Year's Eve, or they tape it previous and then they taped it on the thirteenth? Of December and, th- and they broadcast it on New Year's Eve. Got it. Yeah. Right. Amazing. Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder giving the finger. Where were these shots? That was, uh, it's called the Seattle, at that time, I think Seattle Center Arena. It's a small okay. arena just on the Seattle Center grounds. And again, it was the same thing like uh, Nirvana. You stand up on the back, you saw the shot. Next shot is where right the side, high up. And then they escorted five or six of us to town to get up front, shoot a couple shots up front. What year is this? 93. 93 also. Early right. before the uh, MTV taping. I, think. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, Pearl Jam were like one of the opening acts on Lollapalooza in the summer of 92. So by 93, they're headlining the Seattle Center Arena which I know you said it's a small arena, but I still think it's like, this is still five, six, 7,000 people, isn't it? I'm not sure what it, what it held, but uh, actually it was uh, December 7th. When uh, they played, 90, of 93? Of 93, yeah, just before the MTV show. Got it, okay. Uh, and then um, Soundgarden. Also another legendary Seattle band. You did not shoot them when they were up and coming. Where is, where's this particular show out here? This first shot, the Paramount again, Paramount's a nice theater for uh, all these bands. Cause I got, I think it was like eight to 9,000 with all their balconies. The Paramount theater holds eight or 9,000 people. I think something like that. Maybe, maybe six. Cause it's got three balconies. Or two balconies. I, I always thought it was like 2,500 people. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. We'll have to, we'll yeah, have to let the, we'll, have, sure we'll have to let somebody on the internet go and check that out. And uh, did you fall in love with this band the minute you started photographing? I mean, here's a shot of Chris Cornell stage diving, you know, crowd surfing, I should say. Uh, the first time I photographed them, I think, not the, I don't think it was the first time, I think it was the second time in 89. Uh, I have great shots of Chris jumping off the stage and crowd surfing and people, people pushing him and carrying him. I mean, you know, to me, this was such an, uh, 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 exciting time to be photographing this kind of stuff because the energy was, was, you know, so intense. Um, did you feel that energy as well? Oh, it was fun. It was, wow. I guess like you did not too many bands do that. Right. The older bands like Neil and uh, the dead and, Santana, they don't do that. So when you got when you see it, it was like, yeah, oh, this is cool, and I'm really glad they lit it for me. Right. Yeah. Kim Thale from Soundgarden. I love this shot with Chris's hair kind of hanging down low, and just a little bit of that red light kind of glowing through it. Yeah. Another one of Kim Thale, the guitar player. So my one of my college roommates, a guy named Stuart Hallerman, uh, he grew up with Kim Thale, this guitar player that we're looking at right now. And they went to high school together and also the original uh, bass player in Soundgarden, a guy named Hero. And uh, so when, when, and Stuart's an audio guy, he owns a recording studio in Seattle and he was Soundgarden's first live sound engineer on the road. And uh, so when Se- when Soundgarden came to the Bay Area in 89, I went out to dinner with Stuart and the band. And that's how I first met them and first became aware of Soundgarden because one of my college roommates, Stuart, was their good friend and their sound guy. So that was my introduction to Soundgarden. And I was fortunate enough to photograph them, you know, 89 kind of, you know, for, for numerous years until they broke up. And then when they came back and did those last shows before, um, you know, Chris's untimely death, uh, 
I even got to do a portrait of Chris for his first solo record and actually shot it at Stuart's house up in Seattle. I flew up there and um, asked Chris if he was okay doing it at Stuart's house. He's like, of course, that sounds great. So um, anyway, love shooting these guys and the, the energy of them on stage is just, you know, off the oh, yeah. charts. Um, I mean, just look at this last shot here of Chris, you know, just like, uh, actually it's the second to last shot where he's just, you know, he had just such, such a stage presence and just such an intensity. And then this one with the, with the other photographers down front, kind of like trying to capture that moment. I, I think that's just is so evocative of like our experience in a photo pit where there's all these people and you can see a, a guy or a guy or a girl on the other angle and everybody's in their different spot and everybody's, you know, hustling to get that shot, you know, and, and there it is right in front of them. So, um, Spring was intense, but uh, tense, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I'm not sure how many, how long the first three songs were. Right. Uh, Springsteen, um, 1988, early Springsteen. Seattle uh, Center Coliseum. What was your assignment for this? Well, that was just, I snuck, snuck my camera in, snuck my tape deck in. I wanted to go see, you know, Springsteen. And again, these shots up front, I had a friend up front, let me sit there for a few shot, socks, a few shots. And later on in the evening, uh, we got busted taping and they took our tape, one of our tapes, not the, and a couple, and one, I think one roll of film or something. The guy just stuck his hand in your pocket and whatever he pulled out, he grabbed. Uh-huh. Took. Uh-huh. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So what happens? This, you know, this shot of him wearing the bolo tie and, you know, so not Bruce, like kind of that look, that that style that he had for that brief period of time. Uh, ben Folds from Ben Folds 5, dynamic performer uh, in 2013. Uh, of course, this is shot digitally. When did you switch from film to digital? Oh, you asked me that last day, the other day, and I I think uh, 2004 or something like that, because I think my uh, Paul McCartney shot was 2002. That was my first time I used a digital camera for a concert. Did so you rent 2004? Did you rent the camera or did you uh, own a uh, camera in 2004? Buddy had one. And one of the local camera store, Glazer's camera. Right. Sure. You heard of them? Yeah, of course. They're, they're uh, the guy who was uh, a Canon man. Let me borrow his. So I think it was a 20 D. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, what? Two, three megabytes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's what these Paul McCartney shots are done on with a long lens. Yeah, and well, it's you, you, soundboard and again, first time ever with uh, digital. I didn't realize what buffering was. I thought that oh, was right. the camera. So back, in, so back in the day, early days of digital, when we were shooting, even if we had a motor drive, so to speak, or could shoot ten in a row, it would take another twenty or thirty seconds for the for the uh, uh, card to catch up to writing the information to the card. And so I remember that in the early days, you know, like nowadays, I mean, literally the cards are so fast. I mean, you could just step on the trigger and shoot for five minutes straight until the whole card was done and it would never buffer. But back then you could maybe shoot six or seven f shots and it would buffer, buffer, buffer. And then you could shoot again and you just had to wait. I remember that it was such a, a weird, awkward thing and you definitely missed shots. And especially with a Paul McCartney where they're giving you three songs and the songs are maybe two or three or four minutes a piece. If they're short yeah. Beatles, Beatles songs, you know, you've got about maybe nine to nine to 11 minutes in the, uh, uh, you know, to shoot. And, and half of that time you're waiting for your cards to buffer um, to write the information. And I, go, I, since I, was buffering and screw. I didn't know what to do with it. And I brought my film camera. Yeah. So you and got some film shots as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in 2004, I believe it was, he played the bridge school benefit and I was just starting to dabble in digital a little bit, you know, but I, those digital photos, the files are like two megabytes, one, two megabytes. It's basically like shooting with an instamatic camera from the seventies, but I also brought my film camera. And so I have a bunch of really great shots of, of him on film, which of course you can blow up as big as you want because you know, it's film and it's, it's the resolution is as big as you can get it scanned. Um, but always fun to shoot, shoot a beetle, always fun to shoot a beetle. Uh, Bonnie Raitt, um, uh, this is in 1990 at the gorge. Is this? Yeah, at the gorge. And this, uh, was from our 20th row seats. And did you have a photo pass? Nope. Smuggled my camera in again. How did you smuggle your camera in? Well, uh, you know how it is with, uh, back in those days, they didn't have metal detectors and they had just 
four or five rows of people going in to pat you down. And I took a two liter uh, bottle of water, cut the bottom off, wrapped my 70 to 200 lens with bubble wrap, put it in, taped the bottom off. And when you go through the line, they used to let you bring your water bottles in as long as it wasn't open. So all they really did is check to see if the cap has been broken. And the so bubble wrap sort of camouflaged it and made it look like yeah, water. Yeah, and they anyway. feel it so kind of squeezed like water. And he, you look at which row you want to go into because you go, uh, this guy's not searching very fast, easy. He's just letting you go through. So you need to right. put the body, you put the body somewhere else and hide it. And right. It, 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 it worked for a long time until they stopped letting you bring water in. Yeah. I used to sneak cameras in. I would wrap it around my waist or under a jacket and I'd always bring a backpack with like sweatshirts in it and, 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 and maybe some books, you know, like paperback books. And what I would do is I'd get online and, and I would have the camera right in front of my stomach, right under my shirt. And I would, um, I would uh, uh, swing the backpack around and put it right in front of that and open it up. And they yep. would pull out all the, the, the clothes and the book and they'd see there was nothing in there and they'd feel it. And then maybe they would feel your sides. But usually at that point, they're just so over you anyway from looking at all the shit in your backpack that they just let you in, right? And it, I never got caught, never never once. I was always able, and again, pre-metal detectors. I never had a problem sneaking a camera into a show. That's, that's uh, the same way we smog I smuggled our uh, tape decks in. Yeah. Uh, David Bowie in 96, correct? 96. 97. I think uh, uh, when I when you showed me this photo, I told you that I think I I shot this same exact tour, and then I looked at my photos, and Bowie's wearing the same exact shirt. So I'm guessing that either I shot, you know, probably went like either Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, or San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. So either I shot two or three days before you, or you shot, and either he wore the same shirt at every show, or uh, it was just the cycle of dry cleaning, and he got it back and and uh, and wore it, but. Uh, uh, this was a theater show, wasn't it for you? Was it the this Paramount? was the Paramount Theater again, and this was actually the first general mission concert in the Paramount. They took the seats out, but what they didn't do, they didn't take the seats out when when they remodeled it. They took the uh, seats and put them on. Well, well, I don't know what you want to call it, but basically, the seats just here's a seat, and then they would rotate. And there's the floor. And they, they, they dug down. So I guess the seats can, they're still attached to the floor. But when it rotates, it's underneath. Got and they it. have the whole floor. And this way they got to have GA shows another, as well as another thousand theater. more people in. Yeah. The so show was, in San Francisco was at a theater also. It was at the Warfield. Um, so, you know, it was great very experience. expensive. But now they have like the Soundgarden show in 13 was another GA. At the Paramount, the same thing with the flipping yeah. seats. It's amazing. I've never seen that at any theater. That was the first um, time. It's like, how'd you do that? Then after the show, you got to walk down and see, oh, they cut the, they cut the whole uh, row of seats out, bolt them to the floor, and they had a mechanism to roll them over. Interesting. It was just yeah. amazing. It, it wasn't cheap. We're going to flash back here to 1976 with The Who opening for The Who. This was the Grateful Dead show that we looked at earlier. This is Day on the Green. Who opened that show? The Who or The Dead? The Dead. The Dead opened for The Who in their own hometown. Uh, and um, did you, is this the only time you've ever photographed The Who? Uh, that was the first time. I photographed them twice since. Love this shot of Townsend leaping in the air with his feet forward. Just such a, whoa, what just happened? Sorry. Um, there we go. Uh, and then Roger takes his shirt off to show that that muscular, well-tanned chest. Yeah. Um, love this shot because you can see everybody in the band again, um, including that guy's head right in front of Pete. If he was just like a couple of inches lower, it would have been perfect. But the amazing again, thing about this is I wish I would have taken a picture of the whole stage when you first walked in because it had a San Francisco street scene and an a English street scene on stage. Ah. Look closely at the lights. These are they had a well. Here's the English trash can. They had phone booths, and then the artwork on the very top of the stage was the Golden Gate Bridge goes into the London Bridge. Oh, very cool. It was. And it's of course, like, why didn't I take a picture? Because that was. I wish I did. 
And of course, I don't know how I forgot that you did shoot the who again, because here are the pictures. Uh, what was great about what year was this? What year was this? This who tour it was 2006 ish. 2002. Wait, six. You're right. Six. Yeah. Cause I shot this tour also here. And what was amazing is that Pete is still jumping in the air. Like, I mean, you know, yeah. he's got to be in his sixties here. I mean, Pete's still just a complete rock star. He walked up, boom. That was one frame and yep. everything seems sharp except his face. Yeah, but that, you know, but that's okay. That's, you know, he's, he's in midair and it's got that, it's got a little bit of movement and motion, which adds to the energy of the photograph. And, and there's space below his toes. <laughs> yeah, which is not always easy to get in that split second when you're capturing lightning in a bottle. Um, the Rolling Stones, uh, you got to shoot them a few times. This is, these were assignments for UPI or? UPI or again, you? yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, this is, is this late 80s, 89-ish? This is 89. 89. I guess this was the Steel Wheels tour. Steel Wheels, yeah. Uh huh. I just watched that DVD last night. Oh, I didn't know there was one. Fun. And again, you look at that one. Those guys are miles apart on stage. Right. <laughs> right. But here's this great shot of Keith and Ron Wood right next to each other. Like, yeah. you know, I, I feel like these guys, you know, even though it was a giant stage, they always would come together. For me, shooting the Stones, I was always trying to get that shot of Mick, Keith, and Ron together. And it was very elusive to get yeah. the three of them to come out and do that thing. But, uh, you know, Mick, of course, the greatest showman ever and just so fun to shoot. Uh, this is Keith, I think, in 94, um, you know, kneeling down with, with, uh, with, with Mick in the background. You know, I shot all these same tours here in the Bay Area. Just always so fun to just be in front of you know, 50, 60,000 people at a giant stadium and being like, you know, right in front of the Rolling Stones. Just they're a super all, they're, powerful. They're running all over the stage. It's like, where do you focus? What do you, who are you right. looking for? Right. And a lot of this stuff you were shooting, even if they were UPI assignments, a lot of the stuff you just wanted to shoot on your own because it, you loved it. You loved yeah. to capture rock and roll. It's, it's, in, our, it's in, our, in our DNA. It's in our heart and our souls to capture these experiences. And it didn't matter if people were paying you money or paying us money. Um, because we just were, we were documenting this important pop culture history. Um, uh, Clapton, you got to photograph him a few times in 98, 2007 and 2011. Is that correct? Yep. All at the key arena. So oh, always in Seattle. So you only photographed Clapton three times in your whole career. Yeah. Which is funny. Same for me. I photographed him in 79, 88 and 98. You know, every 10 years I'd photograph Clapton and that's it for me also. I would love to do a portrait of Clapton, but I think he's pretty much retired. Uh, White England. <laughs> right. Uh, Santana in 95, um, just a little bit before we got to um, uh, Supernatural. Uh, that hat he's wearing, I think that I think that's the same hat that I shot him with, which is the back cover of the supernatural record that came out a couple of years later, because I think my shots from that were also taken in 96, right? Is that what this year this is? Is this 96? 95. 95. So yeah. So I, it may be a similar hat, but uh, that was my favorite shot. And this is at the gorge, the gorge. And I was like, five, this is what shot with my, my 35 millimeter lens. Oh, so you're like five feet away from him. Oh, yeah. I was like, and he didn't care. And it's like, sit right. there and it was a colorful day. Uh, Jeff Beck opened, Santana second, and Rod Stewart closed. Last summer, two summers ago, I was photographing Carlos down at Shoreline. I was right against the edge of the stage. Um, I've got a long relationship with Carlos. I shot, like I said, the Supernatural record and another record after that. And um, he came down front. And he looked at me, he was in the middle of a song and he asked me for my camera and he took my camera and then pointed it at me and tried to take a picture of me in the pit. Okay. And unfortunately the lens was too long and he couldn't really figure out the mechanics of it. And he tried to do it. And then he handed me the camera back and uh, another photographer that was there in his seat actually captured that moment of him with my camera. It was just one of those like weird, surreal things where Carlos was just like in the moment, grabs my camera tries to take a picture of me realizing it's not working and then hands it back to me. It was very, very weird and very, very funny at the time. Uh, but of course, Carlos always very colorful in his outfits. And then of course, here he is all in white, um, you know, mixing it up. And, and, and uh, this is what year is this? This has got to be a few years later. 2011, I think at the, uh, 
They called it the uh, White River Amphitheater. It's on the Indian Reservation. Got it. So like just terrible place to go. For, terrible, terrible place to go to a, a show because getting there and getting back, you got to go to a two lane road. Mm. So the traffic, if you don't get there early, you're going to miss part of the show. Right. And the parking sucks and just getting out. Ah. The cops send you 14 different directions. So ah. You don't inundate one little small town. And Right. I love the difference between these shots because of how colorful he's dressed in the 95 shots, which you shot on film. And then the newer ones in 2011, uh, where he is, um, you know, wearing this all white outfit. Um, great shots. Jeff Beck, is this uh, him opening for Carlos in 95? Yeah. At the, at the gorge also? At the gorge. Right. Again, you know, look how close you are. Right. But isn't the stage at the gorge super high, like six or seven feet high? It, it's it's high, right? They, I guess they built a little ramp for you for the uh, pit. Got it. So you can get up on a little platform. Yeah, it's. Right. Uh, but otherwise, other times I've been there, like Neil's, you're shooting up. Right. But. And then you shot him again in 2011. This is uh, when he played a theater show, correct? Yeah, no, another a small theater, more theater, and that's only like maybe 2,000. Right. I saw the band X at the Moore Theater and the Red Hot Chili Peppers back in the 86 or 7. But this year um, here, they gave me a, a seat. And I took my, uh, they gave me like a 10th row seat. Uh-huh. So, oh, okay, thanks. Put all the gear in my uh, day pack and sat there and watched the show. So you, so you, right. So you shoot and then put your gear away and then you watch the show. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of times with those that's, old days. That's like one of those things with us. Sometimes they'd kick us out of the shows. Sometimes they'd let you stay in the shows. Um, you know, sometimes photographers are first class citizens and sometimes we're second class citizens or fourth class. Yeah. Our fourth class. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, great. They, uh, you know, like I say, if you have a ticket for the show. You got to take your gear back to your car and then come back in and through the front door with your ticket. Right. Yeah. I've, I've had to do that and I've, I've, you know, snuck cameras back in that way also. Um, you know, I'd run up to the door, I'd go back to my car, I'd put all my gear away, except for one camera, one lens and some film or cards or whatever, hide all the gear, run back up to the front door and be like, I'm late, I'm late, can you let me in? And they just would like, uh, you know, my do my girlfriend's already here, my wife's already here, you know, and I'd hand them the ticket and they just let you in real quick. Again, pre pre metal detectors, but yeah, the you know, olden days, <laughs> and the, old, the, the golden olden days. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you want to ask Steve any questions at the end of this, Put them in the comments in any of the places that you're watching. We have Harrison and uh, and uh, Joe Lentini uh, gathering those questions. Um, Hot Tuna, another one of our longtime favorite bands from back in the day. Um, uh, this is 96, the further tour at the Gorge. Oh, right. Okay. Right on. I had to look that up. <laughs> All right. I was at the, that tour. You too, another fun, fun band to photograph, just so animated. But one of those bands that, you know, years ago, you could be right up against the edge of the stage. And nowadays you're in a stadium and you're, you know, if you're 40 to 50 feet back, that's considered front row. You know, it's yeah, these uh, first three are from the pit or off right. the side. Right. And then the ones at uh, Quest Field, CenturyLink or baseball, uh, football stadium right. are 100 feet away. Right. Love this shot of Bono kind of screaming. He's got a little bit of motion on his, his hand and the microphone, but his face is sharp. Like to me, that's just got a great vibe to it. It really feels like fucking rock and roll, you know? Um, there's the edge. Uh, the police shot on film way back in the day. I think this is the early 80s, isn't it? Yeah, I think it was 82, Seattle Coliseum. Uh huh. Smoking. I, mean, I with, guess I really didn't smoke with a camera and they didn't really check back then. I mean, what's interesting is that in 1980, 79, 80, these guys were a club band in the United States. And three years later, they're playing and selling out arenas um, around the United States. And then you came back and photographed the big reunion tour, which was, what year was the reunion tour? 07. Okay. Um, and that's what this is, 07. Uh, God, I yeah. can't believe that was 13 years ago already. June, June of 07. Amazing. Uh that was fun. They were good. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I knew that Sting was going to jump in the air at one point because he did it at every show and I was waiting and I, I didn't get it in the, in, you know, he'd, he'd always do it in those first three songs, but you know, depending on where you were standing, it was a stadium show. Again, it was either easy to get or hard to get, but I, my, my buddy, Kevin Major is a great photographer. He had a great shot of Sting in, in midair from, from that tour. 
Um, Springsteen again, uh, back in Seattle, correct? At the, uh, the key arena. Is that, that the, big the key arena? Then. Yeah. Is that the basketball arena? Yeah. And, and now it's the- called the climate change arena. <laughs> climate <laughs> pledge arena. Uh, All right. Amazon bought the naming rights. Got it. And now and, we have uh, hockey team. And uh, Bruce is always fun to shoot. Now these pictures look like they're taken from far back with a long lens. Is that correct? A 400 from the soundboard. Right. Clarence Clemens, uh, Billy Joe Armstrong, um, uh, 2009. You're, why are you still shooting young bands? Like, why do you, why did you care enough to go out and shoot Green Day? Hey, cause they were coming to town. Right. I haven't shot them. I knew I, I'd be able to sell a few pictures to the magazines and SEPA bought it. You know, I would send all my stuff to SEPA press in right. New York and they would sell them that way. Right. And just to clarify, when Steve says sell, what he really means is license. So he's allowing, he's allowing magazines or newspapers or other, other publications to use his photos on a licensing basis. He's not giving, he's not selling them for them to use forever. Typically they can use it. It's just like renting a car. You can use it for, you know, three days and you only, you can drive it. You know, you can use this photo one time in the magazine and you can't give it to anybody else. Um, And that's how we make a living by licensing these photographs. And so that's what Steve is referring to there. Um, uh, Super fun to shoot green day. Always love to shoot them. Uh, Billy Joe, just super animated. Uh, ACDC, another band that I've only gotten to photograph once. Um, were you a fan or again, was this just an assignment and you were just excited to go uh, out to some rock and roll? A semi fan, but I knew it was worth going. So this is about, uh, what, four or five frames that survived the uh, 10 moves I did. Uh huh. It's all slide film. Got it. Right. And, and remember and, back then, the, the lighting sucked. Right. On stage. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that um, the reason why that these photos have sort of a blue cast to them is because Steve probably brought what would be called incandescent based film, tungsten based film, which has a lot of blue in it. But they use a lot of big spotlights, which are daylight balanced. So it makes your film look a little bit more bluish, bluey, bluish white as opposed to warm. And because, you know, when we would bring film to shows, we never knew what kind of stage lighting they would have. Sometimes it would just be all incandescent lights, which is like a warm light bulb, and you would need that blue film, but sometimes they'd have big spotlights. And if you had that film versus daylight film, it would go blue as opposed to staying neutral or warm. So it was always a crapshoot as to what film we should bring. And uh, if it was the, the correct film balanced to the correct lighting that the, 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 the artist was brought with them. Uh, whereas with digital, you can adjust that with just a couple of twists of a knob and, and make sure you've got the correct uh, color temperature. So your, your photographs are the correct. Uh, if you want them warm, they can be warm. If you want them blue, they can be blue. Um, so, uh, talking heads, uh, Seattle center arena, 1983. Um, were you a big talking heads fan? A little bit. It wasn't my favorite, but I liked, uh, liked the music, like the album, uh, stop making sense or start making sense. Stop making sense. Um, and, so- and the movie. Uh, so I have a I have a story about this exact show because I was there. Um, I lived in Olympia, Washington in 1983. I was in college and uh, we were poor, starving college students. And so we made counterfeit tickets to go to this show. And this is pre-computer. So we actually took some theater, not like not like uh, uh, computer generated tickets. They were theater tickets that we bought that some friends had bought at, at the box office. And we photocopied them in black and white and we uh, hand colored them with watercolor paints and uh, glued rubber cemented multiple layers of <clears throat> the, just the regular paper together, perforated them. And we all went to the show and tickets, I think were $12 and 50 cents. And about 10 of us snuck into the show um, with these counterfeit tickets. They totally worked. I still actually have my, my counterfeit tickets to this day somewhere. And uh, many years later, I was doing a photo shoot with David Byrne here in San Francisco And I told him that story. I said, in 1983, when I was in college, I went to the Stop Making Sense tour and I made a counterfeit ticket and snuck in. So I said, David, I think I owe you $12.50. Took out a $20 bill with interest and said, here, David, let me pay you back. And he looked at me, said, Jay, 
He said, it's all good. The statue of limitations is up. You don't owe me any money. And so he didn't take my money, but I did go to this exact same show. Uh, the only time I saw the talking heads um, and I am a big talking heads fan. So I was um, thrilled to do portraits of David Byrne and the talking heads years later. Um, but anyway, I was at this exact same show that you were, that you shot of them doing Stop Making Sense. There's Get another story. GA show. There's my story. Super fun stuff. Uh, dance moves and everything. Really, really, really great. Uh, now we get back to Emmy Lou Harris again. Um, Emmy Lou, this is in some small club in LA in the mid 70s. It's called a Palomino. 1975? Something like that. Yeah. And all the country western uh, people play there. You see the name of the radio station back there in the back. Right. That's the local country station. So it was really a country bar. But this is when Emmy Lou and the hot band played. And how and, many people do you think are in this venue? Like 50, 100? Oh, probably uh, a little over 100, 120. Right. A uh, small the bar. The, the, you know, the seats, good... seats in front, tables and everything. Right. I'm the not sure if they old... serve food or whatever. We just drank. Right. <laughs> the good old days, seeing legendary artists in clubs like this. Uh, Emmy Lou again. Uh, is this the hot band also? And is that Jimmy Buffett on the left there? Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, that was at a... Uh, Banjo Guitar Festival in Cal State Long Beach, 76, 77, something like that. Right. And you know, what's funny is that if you actually called something a banjo and guitar festival and, you know, it probably would probably would fail, you know, <laughs> nowadays you could do it. Well, that was um, like the fifth annual. Wow. All right. Well, maybe I'm wrong. So there you go. Um, and that's Guy Clark over there in the cowboy hat singing into the microphone on the left. Correct. Yeah. Guy Clark, Rodney Crowell. Um, not sure that's Amy Lou and that's yeah, Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, I don't think I want and Jimmy Buffett. That's Amazing. Jimmy Buffett. Got, uh, harmonica player is Jimmy Buffett's harmonica player. I forgot his name. Okay. Amazing. Just such a historic photo. I mean, Guy Clark, obviously, we lost him a couple of years ago. Texas Troubadour. If you guys are looking for some interesting music later today, my buddy Jackie Green is doing a live stream at 5 p.m. on the West Coast, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. I think it's just on Facebook and YouTube under just look up Jackie Green, but he's actually doing a special show today. That's a tribute to Texas Troubadours. And I know he's going to play some Guy Clark songs. Um, uh, he told me, I just, just remembered that. So if you're not familiar with Jackie Green and you're looking for some free music, um, he calls it value for value. You can donate if you want, you don't have to, but if you like the music, you can and uh, check him out. I think you guys will really dig it. If you're looking for a really good, late afternoon, early evening uh, music experience today, uh, Sunday, January 31st. Uh, Emmy Lou again, uh, an, uh, another outdoor show. Um, who's the Laguna guitar Beach. player in her band there? That's Laguna Beach. Yeah, who's this guitar player? Do you know? Oh, Al Albert Lee. He just, he's a damn good guitar player. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Um, not to be confused with Alvin Lee of 10 right. years after, um, Albert Lee is an American guitar player. Is that correct? Or was he British also? I can't remember. I think he was British because he plays with Eric Clapton on a couple of the crossroads. Right. Right. Got it. Okay. Yeah. This is a great little venue. It wasn't very big. It was outdoor mm -hmm. amphitheater. Got good photos, good tape from it. Right. Back in and the days, uh, I didn't, you know, we didn't care about taping too much. Right. Early picture of John Prine um, in black and white. Uh, early 80s? Uh, yeah. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, well, let me just kind of look it up here real quick. Like, did you shoot John Prine because you loved his music or because you were on assignment? Well, I loved his music. 83, February 83. Right. I didn't discover uh, John Prine for, to, to, for a few years after this, uh, probably even early 90s. Um, but boy, what a songwriter and what a loss this last year. Well, him and so Steve Goodman were playing that same show. I have a shot of them together, but it's not very good. Right. But and I Steve actually Goodman. have John, John signed it when I saw him in a recent show after that. And Steve Goodman died six, eight months or so after that show. Yeah. Steve Goodman died very young, didn't he? Yeah. Here in Seattle for leukemia. Right. Right. Another legendary singer songwriter. Um, a couple other more recent photos of John Prine. Of course, uh, again, just super sad, you know, John, John had some surgery on his neck a few years ago, and they used to ask us to shoot from his other side. Uh, Tom Petty. Uh, where are these at? These are the Gorge also? The Gorge, yeah. Shot on digital? 
Yep. Uh huh. And uh, photo pass or snuck in camera? That was a photo pass. Yeah, they let me in, and I, it was in uh, 2010. Is this the only time you ever shot Tom? Uh, I shot him at the gorge a couple years earlier from my seat. Right. Uh, fish at the gorge. At the gorge, 99. Right. What'd you think of fish being an old deadhead? They're good. I liked them, but not as. I I wouldn't go to see three shows in a row like I used to do with the dead. Right. I would, <laughs> but I. Like yeah, it's them. they're good. I you know right. I've seen them in three or four different places and. Right. They're fun. I saw them in Ar in Arizona and uh, at that uh, blockbuster theater there, which is a terrible place to go. I guess the seats are covered in the uh, with metal roof, and then when it's hot, guess what happens? The people in the seats get hotter. <laughs> right. Um, what about um, what about uh, Willie Nelson, who I have up on the screen now? Are you are you a long time fan of Willie? Oh yeah, long time fan. Right. And where's where's this particular shot that we're looking at right here? This first one. This looks like the it's Kingdom be early eighties. Yeah, uh, nineteen eighty. See here. 1986 mid 80s okay 86 willie you know it's just weird to see willie with short hair and kind of robust i mean you know willie's 80 what 88 89 years old isn't that is that correct i think that's about where he yeah. is i mean you know it'll be interesting to see if willie can come back and tour one more time before you know with with covid and everything else um it'd be sad to you know to to have somebody like Willie never be able to tour again or, you know, or a David Crosby or, a, you know, any of these artists that are in their late seventies, early eighties, buddy guy, you know, stuff like that. Um, I just hope that this, these last, you know, these two years of no music, I hope doesn't prevent us from, you know, getting back to, you know, music festivals like Lockin or the Capitol theater in Port Chester or the Warfield or the Fox in San Francisco or, you know, any of the, any of the festivals that we love and, and go to. Um, it just canceled you know, Coachella this year oh they yeah it's yeah it's sad um is this the only time you photograph willie well, i've got it about three or four other times but that was uh probably about the third time right and again it just smoke walk didn't even, i don't know just carry your camera in right well, obviously it was right up front for the shots right. Willie looking right at me going take the shot and go kid All right love these shots um I'm on the slide now, which is what my next show is going to be. And I just want to talk about this for a second before we go to questions um, for, 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 for Steve. Uh, in two weeks on Valentine's Day, we're going to switch gears a little bit. And we're going to talk to my old pal, Michael Greco, about his new book, which is called Punk, Post-Punk, New Wave. And uh, very different from, you know, the Grateful Dead scene and whatnot. Perfect for Valentine's Day. Uh, this photograph that I have up on the screen here is of the clash. Of course, uh, Michael is a legendary, legendary photographer, LA based major celebrity Hollywood photographer, but this is his roots. This is where he started as a, as a young kid in his early twenties, he was a newspaper shooter in Boston. And most of this book here, I believe actually the whole book is basically shot in, in Boston. I mean, there's some Cape Cod and stuff like that. But uh, I mean, this is going to be a really fun one. So on Valentine's Day, same time, 10, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern, um, we will be talking to Michael Greco about po punk, post-punk, new wave, on stage, backstage, in your face, uh, rock and roll. I want to mix it up a little bit. And uh, I've got a buddy up in Seattle, who uh, another guy named Charles Peterson, who shot a lot of Nirvana and Soundgarden. I'm hoping to get Charles on my show. I've got a guy named Larry Holst coming up. Larry's an old hippie deadhead friend of mine. We're going to get him later on. Um, I've got Ed Perlstein. I've got Chester Simpson, shot a lot of punk and new wave and San Francisco stuff. These are all people that are going to be coming on to photos with stories over the next few months. So keep your eyes out on the Facebook page and the Instagram page and uh, to see who my guests are. But basically every other Sunday from here on out into April, we are booked with photos with stories. And hopefully you guys dig these shows. Uh, Harrison, um, our trusty marketing executive over at Relics Magazine. Do we have any questions for Steve Schneider? Our first question comes from Kim. And Kim wants to know if you've ever photographed Todd Rundgren. Sorry, nope. Yeah, I guess... I don't know how many times you toured here in the past few years. Todd's a really fun one to shoot also. And even to this day, you know, Todd's in his seventies, I believe. 
and he's still very animated on stage. I shot him. Uh, actually, I think it was a Bill Graham Memorial Foundation benefit show, I think, uh, a few years ago, six, seven years ago. And he was jumping in the air and doing splits and whatnot. So Todd is a fun one to shoot. I've actually only photographed him, I think, two or three times live, including once in the late 70s. And maybe I did a portrait of him once or twice. Uh, he used to live in the Bay Area. But um, so there's my answer to that question. I have shot Todd, but Steve, apparently not. Another question. Our next question comes from Jack. And Jack wants to know, in contrast to your on stage live music photography, do you have any experiences uh, in a more portrait setting? Oh, I've shot portraits, you know, all the time for my uh, other clients. Uh, I do conventions and the convention people wanted portraits of their executive directors and stuff like that. Most of them are been natural light that I do have a few times. Like I do a lot of, used to do a lot of work with Nordstrom's doing portraits and that was just quick down and dirty two lights shoot they got then they went to work our uh, next question comes from mike mike wants to know who is the first band to give you issues about getting a photo pass issues by saying no or issues by saying i guess uh like who issued him a photo pass who's the first band to actually give him an official photo pass I think or, this is referring to uh, maybe any mishaps with a photo pass. Got it. Oh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, since I was getting f passes as a wire service and not a local newspaper, or a lot of times they say we don't want wire service. We, if they wanted uh, like the Seattle Times, it's okay. But UPI, because you sell your pictures. Well, no, we sell the service. So it's it was a hit and miss. Like the uh, last uh, uh, Paul McCartney tour here in Seattle when he played the stadium, they said no. Yeah, a lot of, you know, it's not always easy to get a photo pass and, 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 and there's more and more restrictions every day. It was certainly easier, like Steve was saying, you know, even back in the early 80s when there would be only two or three or four or five photographers at a show, a lot of these artists wanted photographers there. And then it became really inundated with too many photographers and they'd get 40 or 50 requests and they'd give 10 photo passes to a show. You can't have 40 or 50 people in a pit at a theater, you know, at the Fox theater or the Warfield or the Capitol theater in Port Chester. You can't have that many people in the pit. And so, and uh, you know, and then of course with the advent of social media, people wanted photographers again, because they wanted that content. They wanted access to that content. It's sort of been this ebb and flow thing over the years. And then as a lot of these artists started getting older, the Paul McCartney's, the Neil Young's, the Tom Petty's, they started making you shoot from the back of the room by the soundboard instead of the pit. Um, you know, and a lot of the women artists, the Janet Jackson's and the Shakira's and the Taylor Swift's, they don't want you to shoot more than a song because they don't want you shooting when they're sweaty. And so the restrictions always are piling up. Uh, but, you know, the three, the three song rule, if any of you have ever been at a show and been up front and you watch photographers get escorted in for three songs and then get escorted out, apparently that was started by Bob Dylan. That's the rumor. That's the story that I've always heard is that Bob Dylan was the one who first instituted first three songs in the pit and then you're out. Um, and, uh, and that's the truth for a lot of bands still to this day, unless you have a relationship with the band and you have all access and you can shoot the whole show. Um, you know, typically you're in for three songs and you're out. Story with Eric Clapton back in 98, when I shot him, you see it was uh, off to the side by about, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 feet. Evidently from that point on, it was the soundboard because I guess earlier tour in the pit photographers got in a fight elbowing you know get out of my way get out of my way and that's what uh the road manager told me that's why you're standing here and not up in the pit yeah because clapton doesn't want to see stuff like that i mean that's just ridiculous that that would even happen oh definitely ridiculous right all right let's do a couple more questions harrison our next question is from kelly and kelly wants to know what is your favorite camera of all time and have you ever photographed dave schools of widespread panic I haven't photographed widespread panic. Uh, I'm a Canon man. So right now I'm uh, just bought the new Canon R5 uh, mirrorless camera. So I'm playing with that along with the new uh, 600 millimeter lens, playing with that. 
shooting more birds now because Every day it seems like so trying to get a picture of him in the air flying it's kind of hard with the 600 <laughs> right fun a heavy 600 it's f4 <laughs> for your photographers out there all right let's our next question more. comes from uh, charlie from youtube and charlie wants to know have you guys lost track of how many concerts you have seen or do you have a ballpark number yes no one, yes. <laughs> I uh, plus, uh, I have uh, over 190 concerts that I have images of. So that's one way of counting for me. But in the old days, we would go to shows, see what three dead shows in a row. I would only photograph one day. We'd do a, a Southern California tour of six, seven shows, and I would photograph maybe two. But yeah, I had a, I was terrible in the old days of keeping track of my shows and ID in them and stuff like that. Thank goodness for Jerry Garcia and his different guitars. Cause then I can yeah. figure out when I shot that show. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for me, I don't really know. I mean, I'm this, I'm going to guess that I've seen 5,000 concerts. I mean, you know, there was a time where I was going out three, four nights a week shooting shows for years and years and years. Um, I, you know, how many bands I've photographed. I bet you I've photographed well over 5,000 bands. Um, impossible to say, but, you know, of rock and roll. I know that for a fact. You fell into the right place at the right time in the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, all that hustle, we were out shooting all the time. You know, we've, I've scanned almost 90,000 pieces of film here. And uh, I know I have, getting close to 2 million digital files in my archive. Are they all up in the uh, cloud or you have it all at home? Both. Yeah. So uh, next we have time for one more question. Yeah. So this question is from another YouTube user and they want to know what are some of the biggest mistakes you see inexperienced photographers making in the pit and do you have any advice for new photographers who are looking to get involved in the concert scene? Well, I, I don't know. The last few shows I thought were not in the pit. Uh, it's just be, be aware of who's around you and don't step in front of them as they're ready to shoot. And be, be nice. Like I said earlier, we heard the stories about fights in, in, a, in a, the pit. Yeah. And I know you have, you have more to say about that. Uh. Yeah, I'll always be courteous. So for a new photographer, so first of all, now that everybody's shooting with digital camera, the same camera, same lenses, um, you know, the, if you want to be successful at this, you need to set yourself apart. So if everybody else thinks that the best angle is over on the right side of the pit, house right, and there's 10 photographers over there, rather than going and fighting for them, Go left and try and get something different. Even if you fail at getting the simple safe shot, you might get the one, you know, you might not get a hundred of the same shot, but you might get one really great different shot. And that's what will set you, set you apart, right? You want to be able to shoot differently. You want to, you know, I always say, if they all go right, you go left. They go left, you go right, right? Don't, you know... You don't want to. You don't want to just copy what everybody else is doing. You want to speak with your own voice. You want to create your own voice as a creative photographer. And the only way you can do that is by taking risks. And sometimes, so if you have an assignment for UPI, which of course doesn't exist anymore, if you have an assignment and somebody's saying, "I need you to come back with one good, clean photo of this band," if it's just a picture of a guy in front of a, a microphone or a girl in front of a microphone singing, and that's your one shot that fulfills that that obligation for that assignment. 
spend the rest of your time trying to get something that's different. Take risks because no risk, no reward. That's the first thing that I'll tell you advice wise, because if your pictures look like everybody else's, why does anybody even care about you? Right. You need to, you need to set yourself apart that way. Number two, I would say don't become a music photographer and go get a law degree or become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or, or a technology person or an engineer or do something else. Cause you'll, because you might be able to make a little bit of money as a music photographer, but it is not easy to make a living as a music photographer. And, uh, and I think that any photographer that shoots music can tell you that. I'm very fortunate that I actually have been able to do that. I don't know how I did it, um, but it's a combination of, of, of hustle and um, relationships and being in the right place at the right time and working my fucking ass off for 40 years. Um, but I feel very blessed and, 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 and lucky that I've been doing it. And I actually have made a living at it, uh, but it is not an easy thing to do. Um, so go get a good education and go figure out something else to do because that's, and do it as a hobby, do it for fun. That's why I went to become an event photographer here in Seattle. Conventions pay. Rock and roll doesn't. All right. So listen, everybody, um, as you know, um, a lot of these photographs can be purchased as fine art. If you want to reach Steve Schneider, here's all his info up on screen. His website, steveschneiderphoto.com. His email, steve at steveschneiderphoto.com. On Facebook, he's steve-schneider-photograph. On Instagram, he's Steve Schneider Photo. On Instagram, I'm Jay Blakesburg. Um, if you're looking for art to hang and Valentine's Day is coming right up, if you saw something of Steve's that you love, shoot him an email. It might be a great Valentine's present. If you're looking for something that Steve didn't shoot, go to the Morrison Hotel Gallery, an incredible collection of beautiful, beautiful photographs that are available for purchase, right? So if you're looking for something like that, check it out. It's out there and it makes an incredible gift for somebody that you love. So contact Steve. Again, join us in two weeks on Valentine's Day for our our look at punk and post-punk and new wave with Michael Greco. Uh, thanks to everybody at, at Dayglow and at uh, fans.live that helps me put this on. Steve Schneider, thank you so much. I also want to thank the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation for being our, our um, co-sponsor charitable uh, uh, organization. If you feel like donating to them, please do so. Um, in the time of COVID, they are not able to raise money through their normal channels, which is uh, um, live benefit concerts and whatnot. Um, thank you for watching and uh, thank uh, you. One Steve. thing, Jay, one more thing. You mind? Go ahead. I want to try to uh, plug my book I'm working on. Please do. It's called uh, The First Three Songs, Rock and Roll at 1 25th of a second. It, I'm working on it now. Hopefully it'll be out by Christmas. All right. Congratulations. It's really fun to do a book. It's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. You know what the, how hard it is. Absolutely. I've this will done, be my first book. Right. And I've done 15 coffee table books of my work at this point. So not an easy task. All right, Steve, thank you so much. Stick around for a minute. We'll chat afterwards. Um, thanks everybody for joining us and check out Jackie Green for some live music at 5 p.m. today on Facebook, his Jackie Green Facebook page or YouTube. All right. Until next thanks, time. Everybody. Thanks everybody. We appreciate you being here.